Now our next scripture reading for this morning comes from the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 65, verses 17 through 25. For behold, I am creating a new heaven and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered. They shall never come to mind. Be glad then and rejoice forever in what I am creating. For I shall create Jerusalem as a joy and her people as a delight. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in her people. Never again shall there be heard the sounds of weeping and wailing. No more shall there be an infant or gray beard who does not live out his days. He who dies at a hundred years shall be reckoned a youth. And he who fails to reach a hundred shall be reckoned accursed. They shall build houses and dwell in them. They shall plant vineyards and enjoy their fruit. They shall not build for others to dwell in or plant for others to enjoy. For the days of my people shall be as long as the days of a tree. My chosen ones shall outlive the work of their hands. They shall not toil to no purpose. They shall not bear children for terror. But they shall be a people blessed by the Lord, and their offspring shall remain with them. Before they pray, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will respond. The wolf and the lamb shall graze together. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the serpent's food shall be earth. In all my sacred mount, nothing evil or vile shall be done, says the Lord. The grass withers and the flower fades. The word of the Lord lives forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So the last few weeks, we've jumped around in the history of Israel looking at a few of its prophets. Two weeks ago, it was Habakkuk giving a message of hope at the time of Jerusalem's destruction in the exile to Babylon, an exile that would last for two generations. Last week, it was Haggai motivating his people 18 years after they returned to Israel to allow to re return to Israel from Babylon, from exile, 18 years later and they were working on building the temple and they were completely discouraged about how it was going. Messages of hope to drive the people forward through what they are facing. Now today we look at Isaiah. Isaiah is a more familiar prophet. We um, know his writings a little bit better. We uh, talk about Isaiah a lot more. Uh, in the later days of his prophecies is where this comes from. Now, uh, if you're not aware of the time span of Isaiah, because, you know, we talk, we've been talking about that with the other prophets, Isaiah's time span is really, really long. Isaiah's time span is there before the exile. It's there during the exile. It's there after the exile. How exactly this is accomplished is up to um, uh, quite a bit of debate. But basically, where we're at here is in Isaiah. Isaiah after the exile. Sometime uh, around those 18 years earlier when the people were first allowed to return home from Babylon. And this is the 18 years uh, before the prophet Haggai's time when they were working on building the temple. This is when they were first allowed to return. And uh, this was a time that they needed a strong word of hope and inspiration, a strong word of encouragement. Something to look forward to. Because those people who were returning, they knew they were returning to this land that had been completely wiped out, completely destroyed. Nothing was there. And it was that kind of sense of, why even return? What's the point? We've made our home in this new place for two generations. Is it even worth traveling all the way back and just starting from scratch for the great Jerusalem? 
Is it possible? Is there any purpose to it? Isaiah was letting them know that, yes, there is purpose. Yes, this is important. That God was still with them. And that God was not only with them to help them drudge through the, the muck that was there, but God was with them doing something new and exciting in their midst. Something special was happening here. Now, if we look closely at the Isaiah passage, um, it enlightens us to a lot of, of where the people were in their thinking, in their feeling, the struggles that they were facing. And there's a lot more to think about than uh, what we just find at the surface. And so, you know, we find his words saying, I shall create Jerusalem as a joy. Okay, as we just talked about this place, that was decimated and turned into an absolutely miserable place. God is promising that this will be a place of joy once again. And uh, Israel's people, her people as a delight. These people who were conquered, robbed, humiliated, removed from their homes, left with nothing, moved to a strange place, separated from families. These people will once again be God's delight. God says, I will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in her people. This is a big, big change from the anger that they were facing from God through uh, um, this past time, uh, the situation that they had found themselves in. This is a great change. Never again shall there be weeping and wailing. Not only is this a great change, but this is one of those kind of wildly unbelievable um, changes. And this is being said to people who have had so, so much to cry about. I mean, we try to imagine that in our own lives, imagining a world without any weeping or wailing, without any reason for sorrow. And it just doesn't seem realistic to us. Now, place yourselves in the shoes of these Israelites who are just coming back from the exile. And nothing. There shall be no weeping and wailing. No more shall an infant or gray beard not live out their days. Young and old alike are killed before their time, have been killed before their time. God is saying this will end. That the norm will be to live to 100 years old. It's a pretty incredible number. We, uh, we celebrate big time when, when somebody reaches 100 years old because it's such a great achievement. And this is being talked about as becoming the norm. What a sight. What a beautiful vision that Isaiah is sharing with his people here. Saying that they will build houses and live in them. So this isn't um, just a, a message of saying, okay, yes, they'll get to be selfish and not have to do things for other people. This is to a people who have been forced into all kinds of labor situations um, that were not beneficial to, the, uh, to them at all. Did not um, give them good pay. Did not help them establish homes for themselves. They've been in exile. They've been in this foreign land basically as prisoners. But this time will come that they can build their own houses once again. They can have a place to call home once more. They will plant vineyards and enjoy their fruit. Getting to enjoy the fruits of their labor is not just slaving away for nothing. Saying my chosen ones will outlive the works of their hands, not having to die early and having worked for nothing. They will not toil for no purpose. Rather, they will be purpose-driven. Everything they do will be driven by the purpose of God and, and will have a positive outcome and will benefit them and their surrounding community. They shall not bear children in terror. They don't have to worry about their children um, dying at, at childbirth and child, children being kidnapped. As the families were separated in the exile, they don't have to worry about being separated from their families anymore and they can watch their children grow up. They can bear children in peace and security in an environment of love. Such a dramatic change for these people. Their, shall, their offspring shall remain with them, not torn away to never be seen again. They shall be people blessed by the Lord. There will be no question, no confusion. It'll be as clear as day that they are people blessed by the Lord. None of those questions. Is God really here? Is God really with me? Does God even care? No need to ask those questions anymore because it's clear as day that God is there. And that God is blessing them. 
Before they pray, I will answer. No need to wait. God is addressing the needs before the requests are even being made. Say, while they are still speaking, I will respond. There's no need to even complete the sentence. God is at work. God is responding. God is creating. God is lifting these people up. What God is in the middle of creating, as Isaiah describes, it's something so great that it's simply beyond our understanding. Some things just seem unbelievable to us, unrealistic. Speaking of that, we get further down in the passage. The wolf and the lamb shall graze together. Really? The wolf and the lamb grazing together? That's a little hard to imagine. Sharing food instead of being mortal enemies? Now, the picture um, that you saw earlier with the lion and the lamb, that was actually from a different passage, if you're wondering the difference here. Um, this one is about the wolf and the lamb grazing together. And then where it mentions the lion, the lion shall eat straw like the ox, no longer hunting as a predator, and then seeing people as prey. The serpent's food shall be the earth. No worries about sneak attacks from a snake hiding in the grass or in the bushes. These statements are striking because they draw us into this wildlife imagery. And, uh, you know, I, I think there is a lot to be said about that because as one commentator was talking about, um, and as probably most of us go with that part of the passage, uh, it, it's an image of the peace that joy is creating in Jerusalem um, to be so uh, strong and radiate so powerfully unto the world around that even the wildlife are affected. Even the wildlife wildlife are straightened out and can start to cooperate and work together and find some order. I mean, and that's powerful, but I don't think we should get stuck on the imagery of the wildlife, of the animals. You know, as we think, that's just silly. Think about a wolf and a lamb lying down together, a lion and a snake becoming herbivores instead of carnivores. Um, that seems a little out there. But what, what this is saying is much more than just the physical image of the wildlife. Remember what the prophet has been saying the whole time up to this point. Stay with what the prophet is saying. All those statements that have already come, these, even the images of the wildlife are about human communities. The wolf, an empire like Assyria or Babylon or Persia or Greece or Rome, the wolf will not prey on the lamb but will work together with the lamb. We'll work together with the smaller communities like Israel, who would be the lamb in this situation. The lion, an empire that will feed on its own land, on its own property, instead of feeding on the lives of others. The snake, the traitors in the community, and those people, the false friends from other communities who come in and make these false friendships just in order to find their way and sneak attack you. The snake will find new ways to live. God says, on my sacred mount, nothing evil or vile shall be done. The true kingdom of God is being established. Starting at that Temple Mount in Jerusalem and uh, going forth into all the rest of creation. Um, perhaps affecting all the animals in this amazing way, but most importantly affecting us in this amazing way. Communities helping us cooperate and learn to love each other as God has taught from the beginning of time. God is creating something special. God's creating something joyous, something beautiful, something divine, something that's simply beyond our understanding. We know how the real world works. This is something beyond the real world that we know that God is creating. God is creating a new heaven and a new earth. And as Christians, this should ring a bell in our ears. This is a phrase that we know from places like Timothy, places like Revelation. This is a, a, a more original place to find this phrase. Now, I haven't mentioned it yet, but it would behoove us as Christians to consider the start of this new age. It's November, right? I don't know if you noticed that it's November. You probably have. And perhaps thought about that Advent is right around the corner. 
And the prophets that we're studying right now are leading us somewhere. Giving us these messages of hope. Leading us into the start of a new age. Remember, Advent is the time to prepare for the coming Messiah. And so in these passages, we're kind of getting our hearts and our minds ready to start into that, that um, official preparation time for the Messiah to come. In Jesus, we find the true starting point of God's new heaven and new earth being established. Now, with the passage today from Luke that may be kind of tough to understand, is that's just a tough passage to deal with that was read um, as he gives these warnings about the troubled days that they face ahead of them, about all the destruction and the wars and um, the abuse and being arrested as Christians simply for claiming the name of Christ. Those troubles, troubled days of head, um, Jesus is giving clear warnings about those. And you may have noticed his mention of the temple and uh, how it is in its glory days and its prime. It'll be um, torn down. Just to touch on that, um, he's in a time when the temple was not only um, finished and rebuilt from hundreds of years before, but also it had been made spectacular and glorious again by King Herod. Uh, so the temple was once again amazing, but it was going to be torn down this time by the Romans. Jesus' message, despite all these warnings, despite all these troubling things, it's one of hope. As we just find in the last line or two is all we, we get out of that passage. But he's promising that by our endurance through whatever we face, through any hard times ahead, we would gain our souls. We hold fast, we stay strong, press through it. What God is creating will fully come to be down the road. There is purpose. This is why Jesus is the starting point of God's new heaven and earth. Because in Jesus, we find the first building blocks of, the true, uh, of God's kingdom. The, the first building blocks of God's kingdom being placed within us. As we give our lives over to the Lord fully, our souls are straightened out. Our lives are made right. We begin living and contributing to the world in a new way. This is the beginning of a new creation being made, a joyous creation. As we follow Jesus, we serve others, and we invite others to follow him. So not only is uh, everything being made right within us, a new heaven and a new earth being created first within our hearts, but as it is shared, it grows. And those building blocks continue to add up. We're in the middle, really, of God's new heaven and new earth taking shape. Hence the pictures you see. Those pictures are from the Kids Against Hunger event yesterday. And so what you find there is, well, in the top left picture, that's uh, Onita and Jenny and Alice behind her. That was uh, our table um, of the line, the operation. And then the picture to the right of it is the other end of that, that line. It kind of starts out with the rice and the protein stuff and the veggies and things. Um, and then that stuff is all weighed and then um, sealed, and then it's put in the boxes and, and prepared to ship out. Uh, and then on the bottom left, you see a full crowd of uh, the number of people who were there helping. That was just our shift, so that's actually half the crowd for the day. And then on the bottom right, those are boxes and boxes and boxes of food being shipped out to those who are neat, uh, in need. And it was mentioned one-third will stay local, one-third will go to Haiti, one-third will go to the Philippines. A lot of important work being done by the inspiration of the Lord. A new heaven and a new earth being created through followers of Jesus Christ. Because God's been creating life in our souls, we are necessarily moved to share that life with others. God is creating a world where people reach out to one another. A world where there is joy and delight to fill in the gaps 
that are left by trouble and sorrow, where the work we do has a special purpose, where we find ourselves surrounded by peace and love, where there is no question whether or not God is with us, but God's presence is undeniable. God's voice is most prominent and clear, more prominent and clear than any other sound around us. A world where we cooperate instead of hunt each other. Where we bless each other instead of sneak up on and attack each other. God says, be glad and rejoice forever in what I am creating. We have every reason to rejoice in what God is creating. And every reason to participate in it. This is something to believe in. Something to be thankful for, something to look forward to, something to be part of. God invites us into this new heaven and this new earth being created. May we receive that invitation. Give ourselves and contribute to the joyful work of art that God is creating. Amen.